Hi. Uh, my name, as mentioned, is John Rose, and I am a student recruitment officer here at Humber College. And um, you've already been given a sense of what I want to talk to you about, so, so let's launch right in. In 1973, Eric Hoffer said, in a time of drastic change, it's the learners who inherit the future. The learned usually find themselves well-equipped for a world that no longer exists. We certainly live in a time of drastic change, economic, environmental, cultural, demographic, technological. And nobody can tell us what the end result of all that change will be in any of those areas. And certainly no one can tell us what the end result will be of the interactions between the changes in all of those areas. And that presents an interesting problem for those of us in education, both as educators and as learners. So, how do we as educators prepare students for an uncertain future? And how do we as learners take responsibility for building a skill set that's going to be relevant when we don't know what it needs to be relevant to? Now, as Ken Robinson and many others have said, the modern education system was created for the needs of the Industrial Revolution. Now, one can take issue with that in any number of ways, but the one I want to talk to you particularly about now is certainty. Certainty was a hallmark of the industrial age. We knew what we'd be doing, and we knew when, where, and how we'd be doing it. Now, you can argue whether that certainty was rational at that time or if it was just a product of hubris, but what's clear is that certainty is not a luxury we enjoy today. Everyone in this room was hired, or will be hired, to do the same thing, solve problems. Whatever your job description, at the end of the day, what you do is solve problems. You bring a whole wealth of education, experience, specific technical and professional skills, but it's what you do with that knowledge and those skills in new and unexpected situations that will ultimately determine your individual and our collective success. Now, if your success is going to be determined by how you solve problems, you're going to want to choose a set of problems you care about solving. We're all told, we've all heard the message, you've got to find your passion. Now, in my experience, most people interpret that to mean I've got to find something I like or something I'm good at. I contend that it's actually more important to figure out what problems you want to solve. You may not yet possess the skills you need to take on whatever challenges you want to in the world. That's fine. That's what educational institutions like this one are here for. We're really good at helping you gain knowledge and skills, but you first have to think through why you want to gain them. So, you're still left with, okay, I've got to find my passion, but I don't know what I want to do. Well, if you don't know what you want to do, ask yourself what makes you angry. Ask yourself what frustrates you. If you had to put your time and energy and resources into going out into the world and making one thing better, what would that thing be? That thing that you want to change in the world is the best key to your passion because if you're going to put in the kind of time, the commitment, the effort that it takes to truly be successful, you're going to need to really, truly, deeply care about whatever that thing is that you're working toward. We've been educated in a system, and we live in a culture that says, there's one right answer, and making mistakes is bad. Now, sometimes, to be fair, that's true. If you're a healthcare worker and you're figuring out how much morphine to give a patient, there's one right answer, and making mistakes is bad. I enjoy my meds as much as any of you, uh, but it's like the old saying goes, too much of a good thing will kill you. Um, most situations, however, that's not the case. Generally, that idea of the one right answer and the admonition against making mistakes, I think, is misguided because at the point of uncertainty, there is no one right answer. It hasn't been discovered yet. That's your job. You take those skills and that knowledge into new and undiscovered territory. There is no guide. You have to figure out what the right answer is, and the right answer will change over time. Now... You want to build up problem-solving skills, you've got to take on challenges. That's pretty clear. Push yourself. Take risks. Where I think we run into a problem is that we live in a culture that believes in the myth of the cushy job. 
we see, or many of us experience, what it's like to be out at one extreme, overwhelmed, stressed out, and that can lead to a whole wealth of mental and physical health problems. And so the reaction to that is to want to go to the other end of the extreme, the cushy job. But at the other end of the extreme, being underwhelmed leads to being bored and to being, to being depressed, and ultimately, I believe, to losing a sense of your own self-efficacy. If you go long enough never achieving anything, you will begin to believe that you will never achieve anything. So what is the opposite of challenging? Most people will tell you that the opposite of challenging is easy. It's not. The opposite of challenging is boring. That's why it's so important to take on those challenges. And there's a lot of research. Mihai Chick sent me high is the best example, but there are many others. A lot of research to show that people who do work that pushes them, that challenges them right at the edge of their abilities are actually the happy and healthiest people. Life at either extreme is not what you're looking for. So I've got to take on challenges. I've got to build up problem-solving skills. But how do I relate that back to my education? How do I, as a learner, as I said, take on responsibility for building up a relevant skill set? Well, context. And the great thing about deciding what problem you want to tackle in the world is that can provide you with the context for the new experiences you have, the new ideas you're introduced to. Because in order to learn things, in order to take in a new idea, it's got to connect to things that are already in your head, ideas and experiences you already have. The more that's the case, the easier things are to learn and to use. Context provides you with that opportunity. Comprehension is not enough. You must be able to use the things you learn. If they're ultimately going to contribute to your success or allow you to make any meaningful contribution to any kind of greater good. Now, the ability to create context is essential to the conditions in which we learn and work and live, often referred to as the information age. I contend that that's a misnomer. We don't live in the information age. We live in the data age. We're on the receiving end of endless myriad streams of data, but that doesn't mean that we're informed. And if you don't believe me, consider the following. Ask yourself what you know about Stephen Harper. Now ask yourself what you know about Charlie Sheen. I utterly deny that any age in which most people know more about a television star's descent into mental illness than they do about their own political leaders is an age best characterized by information. We have access to unparalleled sources and amounts of data, but we are responsible for turning it into information. We are. It's only data until we create information with it. And if you, if you confront challenges different from the challenges you or anyone else have ever confronted before, you will be faced in part with the challenge of creating new knowledge, creating new information. The more that you work at building up the skill of taking new ideas and fitting them into that contextual framework of the things you care about and the things you're trying to fix, the better able you're going to be to deal with those unexpected situations when they come. That ability to create knowledge is vital, and context is very powerful in doing that. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. Negative 2 times negative 2 is, right, it's 4, positive 4. Why? Two negatives make a positive, right. Whew, someone answered it, great. Okay, you can all relax. Why? Why do two negatives make a positive? Now, I've asked this question of a lot of people, and the answer quite consistently is, because the math teacher told me. I think that's everybody in the world's answer. Well, most people, when they look at this, most people, when they learned it, think of it as an abstract, theoretical thing that's got nothing to do with the real world. The reality is it's a very important real-world concept. And I'll explain to you how. Do the following thought experiment with me. Imagine that every Monday morning you start out with $10 in your wallet. Every day on the way to work, you stop in at the coffee shop, you spend $2 on a coffee and a donut. When you get to work, how much money do you have? You started with 10, you spent two, you've got $8. Now you're a creature of habit, so you do exactly the same thing every day. So you started out with $8 in your wallet on Tuesday, and on the way to work, you stopped at the coffee shop, you spent $2. How much money do you have when you get to work on Tuesday? And on Wednesday when you get to work, you've got, and on Thursday you have, and on Friday you have, 
I don't mean to judge, but that was rather poor planning on your part because it's the weekend and you're broke. Now, you are, as I said, a creature of habit. So the following week, you do exactly the same thing. You start out with $10 in your wallet, and every day you go to the coffee shop. So Monday, you've got $8. Tuesday, you've got $6. Wednesday, you've got $4. Now, Thursday, you're sick. You don't go to work. You don't go to the coffee shop. You don't spend $2. How many dollars are in your wallet? $4. Friday, you're sick again. Don't go to work. Don't spend $2. You've still got $4, right? Okay, so I want you to think about it in the following way. Every time you go to the coffee shop, you are negative $2. We've removed $2 from your wallet, right? But on that Thursday and Friday when you were sick, you are negative two trips to the coffee shop. We have removed two instances of removing $2 from your wallet. What was the net effect on your wallet? You had four more dollars. Do you now understand why negative two times negative two equals four? It's not an abstract theoretical concept. It's the most basic budgeting concept in the world. Now, the only thing that I've changed for you is context. But it made a powerful difference in your understanding of this concept. And what's interesting about this is that this was data, and I just turned it into information for you. If I tell you negative 2 times negative 2 is 4, but you don't know why or what it relates to, it's not information because you can't use it. You can't do anything with it. Context gives you the opportunity, the power, to turn data into information. If you ever find yourself in a lecture or a classroom or whatever it is, and you're saying to yourself, why is this relevant? When will I ever use this? That should be a signal to you that what you lack is context. Now, I would like to end with this. Don't assume that you know what you're capable of. Don't assume that your experiences to this point in education, in work, and in life have given you an accurate sense of your potential. You're probably capable of far more than you imagine. In many years of having conversations with people about education and career and all of the things that surround that, I've come to recognize that everybody has a gap between what they believe they're capable of and what they can actually achieve. Now, it's by no means an exhaustive list, but my hope is that the things I've talked to you about today figuring out what problem you want to tackle in the world, and then using that as a context for the experiences you have and the ideas that you're introduced to, my hope is that those things can help you close that gap. Because collectively, we face significant challenges. And we need you. We need all of you and all that you're capable of if we're to meet those challenges successfully. Shh. Mm -hmm.